Assalamu alaikum, this is Mahat Tavassam. I'm a member of the National Dean of SCOMI. Today we'll be having with us Dr. Amir Abbas, who is a former member of IFMSA and he has done multiple activities of IFMSA Pakistan. And uh, especially he has been at the position of Secretary General of IFMSA Pakistan and the Regional Assistant of Asia Pacific for Public Health. Currently he's an epidemiologist formerly at the Research University of Aga Khan and currently he's doing Masters in Healthcare Analytics and IT from Carnegie Mellon University, Pittsburgh, USA. Today he'll be talking about studies and designs. Dr. Amit, can you please join us? Okay, uh, can you hear me? Okay, so uh, thanks a lot for inviting me for this session. Uh, I'm just going to adjust my screen in a way that I will be able to facilitate uh, sure that Maham is with me throughout the session so that she can help me to conduct this session. I'm going to adjust a uh, few messages which are coming on the screen so that we can go ahead with the session. Uh, in addition to this, I'm going to check uh, all the other logistics. I apologize for the delay because there were two things we were waiting for people to build in as we want it to be a live session. And in addition to this, you might have heard some voices in the background because I forgot to put the mic on mute. I apologize for that as well. Uh, so the session is going to continue uh, like uh, I'm going to present. The topic is study design as already discussed and announced. Uh, I'm going to show my PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to go through slides. And those of you who are watching it live, and uh, those of you, some of you will be watching it live and others will be watching the recording of this presentation. Uh, what I will do is uh, present and while I'm presenting, I will be uh, uh, pausing in between. Like I will divide the presentation into different chunks. And for each of the chunk, I will I'm pause in between and then I will ask Maham because she's monitoring a number of things. She's monitoring whether I'm audible or not. And at the same time, she's monitoring, uh, monitoring if my slides are visible and if there are any questions or not. So those who are alive, I will request you people to make this session as interactive as possible. Number one, what I will request you people to do is uh, to write your questions in the comments and in between if my slides are not visible and or uh, if uh, I'm not audible, please write in the comments and Maham will be able to point that out to me. So uh, I think with this, I'm going to start sharing my screen, uh, the slides in a minute, and I'm going to adjust it in a way that all the professors are visible. Uh, Let me find a, a reasonable way to do this. Uh, uh, I think, uh, Mom, I have to get you off the screen for the time being. And if there is any problem, you can just send me a message. Uh, if, you're, if I'm not audible, then, uh, please send me a message on WhatsApp. I'm just monitoring what is on the computer, and I will be monitored on the WhatsApp as well. Get you off. Yeah. So let me adjust the screen in the right way. And as I told you, people, and give it uh, the full screen. So uh, the topic for today is study designs, and this is the these are the objectives for the today's session. I will be helping you people to identify keywords in research questions that link. Research question with study design. As you people know that we had a question, we had a session previously on research question. And those of you who haven't seen that session, I will recommend you people to once again uh, go back and see that because these sessions are linked. And if you are, there will be concepts in that 
session, which will be linked to study design. I'll be, I will try to enhance the understanding of the participants on the classification of study designs. Uh, then we'll talk about different things which include case report, case series, cross section studies, case control studies, cohort studies, and randomized control trials. I have to emphasize over here that these are all independent concepts, uh, and they, all, each one of them need a lot of detail and a lot of uh, discussion. But I'm just going to give you a very superficial definition of each one of them. So going forward uh, with the first objective, and um, what I will start with is in the form of a story and i will take the example this is a traditional example which is often used in research trainings which is the relationship between smoking and lung cancer so what i will do is uh, i will take this example and i will request the audience and to imagine a time when uh, the, this relationship was not known okay so how this relationship was established uh, this is a question of imagination and uh, when you so the so how we came to know that there is a relationship between smoking and lung cancer so what have, what would happen that sometimes a clinician might have encountered a few lung cancer patients and they might have seen an unusual pattern emerging right so uh, if that is a single case then we call that as a case report and so when you find something unusual like that, you report something like that and communicate to the scientific community, medical scientific community in the form of a case report. And if you find something unusual, which has not been reported previously in the literature, then you report that in the form of a uh, case series. So uh, this report is one case and case series is a series of cases. Okay. So what case report and case series does is that they they generate the question so when you found an unusually high number of smoking high amount of smoking among the lung cancer cases in the clinic at that time but it did it generated a question that is there an association between smoking and lung cancer okay and in order to answer this question so the question which was generated was that is there an association between smoking and lung cancer among patients presenting to the tertiary care hospital in Karachi. I'm just making it up. Okay, like I assume that in Karachi there was a clinician came up with a number of cases which has substantially high number of uh, smoking uh, uh, and, uh, in, and they, they were all lung cancers and we found that there was a pattern and that all the lung cancer cases were having high amount of smoking history. So he reported that in the form of a case report if it is one case and a case series if it was a series of cases and then it generated a question and i just for the sake of example made this question that is there an association between smoking and lung cancer among the patients presenting to the tertiary care hospital in Karachi. so what we can do now in order to answer this question we can either conduct a case control study or a cross-sectional study um, but the limitation of these uh, study designs is that we will not be able to uh, establish a causality. We will be able to establish an association, but not a causality. So the message which I want to convey to this slide is that if you want to check an association between two factors, there are two study design options which you have. One of them is a case control study, and the second of them is a cross sectional study. And in the subsequent slides, we will be talking about what the precise difference is there between a case control study and a cross sectional study. So, the next step is that if an association is established, we are going stepwise in trying to establish the relationship between smoking and lung cancer. And if an association is established from a cross sectional study, um, so what you, what you do, then you ask yourself the question, because whenever we talked about this briefly in the previous session as well, whenever there is an association between two factors as we are taking the example of smoking and lung cancer, that means two things. It means either there is an association between smoking and lung cancer, which means that either smoking causes lung cancer, or there is a phenomenon of reverse causality, which means that for some reasons the, there was a high 
uh, the lung cancer patients started to smoke more. So that is known as reverse causality. So now we ask the question that is uh, the association established from a cross-section study. Then we ask whether the smoking causes lung cancer among patients presenting to the tertiary care center or not. So we ask the question, is there a causal link between the two factors as well? And in that case, what we need to do is to establish a uh, we need to conduct a cohort study. Okay. And uh, so in order to do a cohort study, what is a cohort study? Uh, I'm going to talk to you people in a few minutes uh, about that as well. But the, again, the take home message for, from this slide is that whenever you want to establish causality in an observational study, then you have to conduct a cohort study. Going further, when you establish a causality as well, what you do? You need to you identify the causal factor for every disease. And here I'm implying for the sake of explanation and for the sake of example that smoking is the only thing uh, uh, which causes lung cancer, but there may be multiple factor, there can be a multifactorial phenomena. But uh, whenever we establish a causality, then um, we want to find out a treatment for this condition. Uh, and then what we do, I've just given you an example of another research question that I'm just going to read it and you can see it on your slides, which is does adding valiparib to the standard treatment for advanced metastatic squamous non-small cell uh, reduces mortality as compared to the standard treatment alone. Okay, so I'm going to use uh, medicine to reduce mortality in a particular set of patients of a particular type of lung cancer, which is non-small cell and uh, non-small cell lung cancer. Okay. So in when such is the situation when we want to find out a therapy and we want to intervene, then the choice which we have is randomized controlled trial. Uh, and the thing doesn't stop over here. If we find out that a particular therapy was useful, then what we do? We do not stop over there. Is one randomized control trial enough to find out and to recommend that a particular therapy maybe or treatment or a medicine should be used and incorporate it in the guidelines? No. Ideally, what we want to do is combine the results of multiple randomized control trials with the help of systematic review and meta-analysis. So in this way, uh, we, we are able to connect the research question to different study designs. And uh, when we want to combine the results of multiple randomized control trials and multiple studies, then the results can be combined with the help of systematic review and meta-analysis. So I'm going to summarize what I've said in the free, previous few slides and then go forward to see if there are any questions. Uh, in case there is no prior study, which is done as in the case of, as we are in the COVID-19 pandemic, and there are a number of situations when there are a number of aspects of the disease we, in which we do not have any study. So what we do, we go for an expert opinion that is considered to be the bottom most uh, level of evidence. But if we do not have any other evidence, then we go for that. Then we report a case report or case series. We go to cross-sectional case control study, cohort study, randomized control trial, and systematic review and meta-analysis. And this is a pyramid where from the lower end, this is the lower, lowest level of evidence and highest level of evidence is systematic review. And I should have mentioned meta-analysis somewhere over here as well. Uh, so with that, I'm going to just uh, stop for a moment and ask if, see if there are any questions. Uh, uh, no, sir, there aren't any questions yet. Okay, there are no questions, and, and in between, I'm completely audible and uh, slides were visible. Okay, yes, so I'm going fine. to go ahead and continue with that. Uh, right, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, move to our subsequent objective, which is, uh, as I'm going to show you people, the uh, again, I'm going to revisit the session objectives. There were the first of all, I wanted to link the terms which are used in the uh, in the stem of the research question to different study designs. Right? We talked about that. Now I'm going to talk about the classification of study designs, and uh, and as I'm talking about the classification of study designs, 
along with that, I will also be explaining these different types of study design. So the best of the two objectives are going to go in parallel. I'm going to go to the slides. Uh, there are a number of classification systems, and this particular slide is an example of one of the classification systems. Uh, uh, this is a second classification system. I'm going to put in the references of both of them in the description if you are interested in to go into them. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to, for the sake of this particular discussion, I'm going to stick to this classification system. The reason why I'm mentioning different classification systems is that maybe you go somewhere and you find things like terms which do not fit into the classification system which I am referring to. And you have to understand there are more than one uh, classification system. So in that scenario, people might be using different classification systems. Uh, so as this is a um, uh, detailed flow chart, I'm going to walk you people through step by step into this flow chart. And in the first step, as you can see, I'm just going to uh, replicate that uh, this flow chart in a stepwise fashion. Uh, so, uh, the first step when you, whenever you are classifying a study design into different categories, you ask the question that did investigator assign the exposure? Okay, this is a very simple question that was the exposure assigned by investigator or you were just sitting there and observing it? Okay, so as we talked about the example of valley parent, okay. Uh, what was doing and what was going on the investigator assigned the the drug into or if you take the example of suffos randomized control trial of suffos the investigator will assign the exposure of a medicine to intervention in the control in that case we call it an experimental studies and if you just sit there and observe and do not do anything and just like um just observe who is smoking and who is not smoking then that is an observational study. So this is a simple classification point. You ask yourself the question, was the exposure assigned by the investigator or, or the investigator was just sitting there and observing? Going further into the depth of it, uh, uh, the observational studies, when we go into the observational studies, we ask ourselves another question, that is there a comparison group? And if the answer to that is no, which means that there is no comparison group, then uh, we call that particular study design as a descriptive studies. Otherwise, if there is a comparison group, then we call it as an analytical study. Within the descriptive studies, you further ask yourself the question that whether the unit of analysis is a group data or an individual patient or individual person's data. If the unit of analysis is group, then we call it as ecological studies. And otherwise, I'm going to go into the details of ecological studies and I'm going to come back to the individual studies in a minute. So talking about ecological studies as well. So what do I mean that the unit of analysis is group? For example, you are sitting in the World Health Organization headquarters and you want to see the correlation between different factors, say uh, prevalence of tuberculosis and poverty, but you do not go to each individual and collect individual level data. But you, what you do is you collect the data of different countries. So you find out the prevalence of diff, uh, tuberculosis in different countries, and you find out the level of poverty in different countries. Therefore, the unit of analysis becomes groups. In that situation, we call it as an logical studies and it explores correlation between aggregated exposure and outcomes. In this case, the unit of analysis is groups. And the, when I mean groups, it can be countries, counties, schools, etc. So it can be different um, types of groups. It's useful for generating a hypothesis, but it doesn't answer a research question or gives a conclusive evidence in 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 favor of in favor or against any hypothesis it is vulnerable to something we call as the ecological fallacy i'm not going to go into the detail of that just for the sake of simplicity and i'm going to go further 
uh, in this. So we talked about the fact that if uh, just I'm going to just for the sake of repetition and we talk we are talking about this particular classification system and uh, we will ask ourselves the question that did investigator assign the exposure if the investigator assigned the exposure and then we call it as an experimental studies otherwise we call it as an observational study okay and when we uh, within the observational studies, we ask the question, is there a comparison group? If there is a comparison group, then it is called as an analytical study. Otherwise, we call it as a descriptive studies. And within descriptives, we classify it on the basis of whether the unit of analysis is group or individual data. Uh, I'm going to pause for a minute and see in the comments if there are any questions. There are no questions. So I'm going to move forward again. Okay. And we talked about uh, the eco ecological studies. And now I'm going to, if the unit of analysis is individual data within the descriptive studies, then there are three types of studies which we have. One is the case report, case series, and cross-sectional studies. So I'm going to talk a bit about case report and case series. It's something unusual. You find out something unusual in your clinical setting or during a war uh, round or in the outpatient department. It's the simplest type of research. It's an unusual presentation and helps to identify problem areas of interest. Uh, so what you can do, how do you find that unusual finding with the scientific community? You write a case report, if it is one case or a case series, if it is a, uh, you know, if there are multiple cases. It cannot test a hypothesis, but it's useful for generating a research question. And there is no measure of execution in this case. Uh, the second thing is a cross-section study. What you do, now the cross-section study is used to find out the prevalence of a particular condition. For example, we want to find out the prevalence of hepatitis C in Pakistan. Um, and then we are going to do cross-section studies and there will be descriptive cross-section studies. And I'm going to uh, come back to this point in a minute because the cross-section studies can be descriptive as well as analytical depending on whether there is a comparison group or not no comparison group so in the, the descriptive crops and uh, cross-section studies we do not have a comparison group so what you do you take a data on a particular group uh, sample and find out the prevalence of a particular condition so you do not have a comparison group and that is known as a descriptive cross-section. In a descriptive cross-section study, you can also find out the distribution of a particular condition in time, place, and person. If you want to find out an association between any factors, let's assume between smoking and lung cancer, as we have been talking about right from the beginning of this session, then we call it as an analytical cross-sectional study. Uh, and I'm going to give you the example with the help of this demonstration. So what will happen? Like if we want to arrive in the, so what I have to tell you people, let's assume that this is your population, okay? And if I want to find out the association between smoking and lung cancer, so let's assume the disease which I'm talking about, the smoke, lung cancer and non-lung cancer patient and the exposure are the smokers and non-smokers. So what I can do, I have either this option in which I will find out the diseased and the non-diseased individual, and then for each one of them, find out who is exposed and who is not exposed. This is one way, okay? And the second way is that first of all, I find out, I ask the people who is exposed and ask them who is not exposed. And within them, each one of them, I ask them that who is diseased and who is not defaced. But in a cross-sectional study, the definition, the defining part of a cross-sectional study is that it doesn't matter whether you start with the exposure or you start with the disease, you you kind of do it all together. What you do is take a population. This is your population. You just ask all of them simultaneously whether you are exposed or you are not exposed. You are diseased or you are not diseased. Okay. So this is the defining characteristic of the cross-sectional study, which we also call as the snapshot study because you just take a snapshot as you take the snapshot or a picture at a particular point and automatically people who are at the same point you divide the people who are exposed and who are not exposed and who are diseased and who are not diseased. And this is the, we call as the analytical cross-sectional study. And uh, so cross-sectional study is uh, 
objective is to generate a hypothesis can be I mean, uh, it can either be used to generate a hypothesis and quantify it and can also be used to check the hypothesis of association. So whenever there is a research question to check the association between two factors, that is, let's assume smoking and lung cancer, then you can use analytical cross-section studies. The measure of association is prevalence ratios. Uh, it can also be used to find out the factors which are predicting a particular condition. Uh, and you can, as uh, with the help of the descriptive cross-section study, you can find out the prevalence or the distribution of a condition in time, place, and person in a particular situation or a particular setup setting. So I'm going to pause and see if there are any questions right now. So far, there are no questions. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm assuming, uh, I'm just going to ask Maham if I'm still audible, if there are any, uh, I'm going to bring her to the screen for a minute and ask her, is there, any, everything is okay so far? Uh, yes, sir. Am I audible and slides are okay? Yes, sir, you're audible and the slides are right here. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to continue the presentation once again and I apologize for this uh, inconvenience as I'm just uh, trying to ensure that in between my sound remains con continually, continuously audible. I'm going to go to my slides once again and go forward. Uh, so uh, some points which I think I left out with in the context of the cross-sectional studies is that they are easy to carry out and it can be useful if the data is collected wisely. I mean, uh, from this point, I mean that at times people have this misconception that if it is a cross-sectional study, it will be a low quality study. If a very good, uh, well-designed cross-sectional studies can have a very high benefit. So it's, uh, especially when you design your study well and you work a lot on your data collection tools, questionnaires, etc. And we may talk about that particular aspect in the future if you get time. And the measure of association can also be odds ratio and pre or prevalence ratio. I would prefer to use prevalence ratio because that's the correct representation of the survey design, but you can also, people have also used odds ratio as a measure of association. Uh, there is a, a, a big detail in this that odds ratio overestimates the measures of association, whereas the prevalence association gives you correct picture. Um, but statistically, it is a bit different. So and maybe we can talk about that aspect in some of the future videos. So going back to the chart which we were talking about, we were here where we were talking about the cross-section studies. And then now I'm going to uh, talk about the analytical. As we said that if there is a comparison group, then there will then that particular study we will call as an analytical study. Okay, and as you can see, the cross-section study is in the analytical classification as well as in the descriptive classification as well. Because if a cross-sectional study has a comparison group, then that is an uh, analytical cross-sectional study. And if a cross-sectional study does not have a comparison group, then that is a descriptive cross-sectional study. So within the analytical uh, studies, you have uh, cross-sectional studies, as I've explained already than the case control and the cohort study. So I'm going to talk about the case control study. What is a case control study? As the name represent, in the case control study, you start with the case, okay? So you recruit a case. So if I'm, so what was the research question? The research question will be, is there an association between smoking and lung cancer, right? Uh, in a particular population. Uh, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to recruit the cases of smoking for maybe, uh, so not smoking, I'm sorry, uh, cases of lung cancer, maybe from pulmonology clinic. I'm going to recruit controls from a clinic, from a similar source population, uh, maybe from another clinic, maybe from endocrine clinic, maybe from um, uh, internal medicine clinic, outpatient department, or so on. And then I'm going to ask them, ask the cases, and the controls whether both of them smoked or they did not smoke. So what I did, I mean, after uh, emphasize over here, I started with the disease and the non-diseased, and I 
after recruiting the diseased and the non diseased which is the cases and the controls i asked them both of the diseased and the non diseased both the cases and the controls whether the cases have ex are exposed to smoking and the cases are not exposed to smoking whether the controls are exposed to smoking where controls are not exposed to smoking so this is an important distinction when i was talking about the cross section study i said that it doesn't matter where you start with what you do is that you simultaneously ask the uh, ask questions whether you smoke or you do not smoke whether you have lung cancer or you do not have lung cancer but the mm -hmm. differentiating point in the case control study is that you start with the disease you start with the non disease and then you ask for the exposed and non exposed so this is how you go ahead with the case control study um so, so you the defining characteristic of a case control study is that you start with the disease ask about exposure and it is subject to what we call as the recall bias which is that cases are more likely to recall about any events and especially the exposure which we are studying uh, in this case which is smoking as an example of smoking and lung cancer the measure of association is odds ratio and the research question is, would be that there is is there an association between two factors which are in our example is smoking and lung cancer and the key word in the stem of the research question will be association so whenever we want to find out that is there an association between two factors we will be we have two study design options one is cross section studies and one is case control study now an important question arises that i'm telling you people that if the there you are asking we are using you are using the word association in the stem of the research question then in which particular study design should you choose is the, so there are guidelines for that if you uh, you can choose cross section study you can choose case control studies but case control study is used for rare diseases and uh, situations where we just want to check whether there is an association or not okay so if a condition is rare and by rare which i mean that the prevalence of that particular condition is less than 10% uh, in addition to that case control studies are also can also be used in situation when the exposure collection of data on exposure is expensive and the disease has a long incubation period or a little little is known about the disease so in all these situations you can use case control studies but particularly uh, it is uh, frequently used in situations when the disease is rare uh, i'm once again going to pause because we have covered a lot of material and you see because if you're in culture there are a lot of thumbs up they are very informative and uh, uh, but uh, there are no questions when you do not have any questions then uh, then uh, either you you understand it completely or you do not understand it at all so i'm assuming with a lot of thumbs up that i'm doing a great job to keep myself happy uh, but i always want to uh, 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 get some questions. Some of my former seniors from IFMSA are also watching this, and also by one of our seniors from IFMSA, some of the founding members. Uh, I'm thankful for their appreciation. And I'm going to go ahead with the presentation and with the assumption that people are understanding what I'm saying. Uh, okay, so this is the classification we feel talking about within the analytical classification we had and uh, we talked about the cross-sectional study case control studies and the cohort studies so now i'm going to talk about the cohort study uh, in the cohort what you do you start with the exposure okay so what you do is that you start with the uh, with the disease free population and classify them into exposed and non-exposed which means that Taking the example of smoking and lung cancer, I will take a population which is free from uh, smoking, uh, sorry, which is free from, not from smoking, which is free from the disease, which is lung cancer. I will divide them into exposed and non-exposed, which, which means that I'm going to classify them into
I think there is some problem. I'm. Uh, uh, is there any problem? Okay. Okay. Uh, right. I'm going to continue. So uh, I'm sorry for this. I think I thought that there was a problem, but there's no problem. So what I'm going to do is. Uh, uh, so I what I was telling you people that you have to find out a disease-free population and divide them into exposed and non-exposed, okay? Which means that in the example of smoking and lung cancer, you find out a population which is free from lung cancer. You divide them into smokers and non-cancer, non-smokers, uh, non and then you follow them up and find out how many of them develop the disease and how many of them do not develop the disease. So. The critical differentiating point in this context is uh, that how many of the individuals uh, that you start with the exposure, which is smoking and non-smoking, and you follow them for a particular period of time and find out both of the gr groups that how many of the smokers develop the disease and how many of the non-smokers develop the disease. Uh, so as I told you people that we start with the exposure and divide the exposed and non-exposed into diseased and non-disease group and uh, it's a comparatively a robust study design it establishes temporality what do i mean by temporality by temporality i mean that the so we started with a disease free population okay and we classified a disease free population into exposed and non-exposed uh and follow them, follow both of the groups. And for the exposed population, we do found out that how many of the exposed population develop the disease and how many of the non-exposed population develop the disease. So that, because the exposure preceded the disease, so established temporality. And this tem establishment of temporality is one of the important criteria to establish causality. Now the uh, the measure of, uh, uh, I will say, the, uh, the the measure which you use over here is the risk ratio or rate ratio. Uh, and we can, one of the uh, strength of uh, cohort study is we can also find out the population attributable risk. It is used in rare exposures and short follow-up time. There's a very short follow-up time. Okay, and uh, I'm going to go forward with the classification. So this is the classification which we, we had. And now I'm going to go towards the, we, we are done with the observational part of the studies in which we talked about the descriptive and analytical studies. And then in, within the descriptive, we talked about the ecological studies. When Within the analytical, we talked about the case report, case series, cross-section studies, and the cross, we talked about the fact that the cross-sectional studies can be descriptive cross-section studies and analytical cross-sectional studies as well, and case control studies and cohort studies. Now I'm going to talk about the experimental studies. And within the experimental studies, there are different types of experimental studies. And as we said that we, when identifying whether a study is an experimental study or not, what we are going to do is to ask ourselves the question whether the exposure was assigned by the investigator or not, okay? And if the exposure were assigned by the investigator, then we call them an experimental studies. And uh, within the experimental studies, there are different types of studies. The famous experimental studies is the randomized control trials, but there are other experimental studies as well, which are the quasi-experimental studies, the crossover study design, factorial study design, and stepwise study design. I'm not going to talk about these other study designs. I'm mainly going to uh, focus on what is a randomized control trial, Randomized control trial is uh, further divided into uh, on the basis into two types on the basis of whether the unit of randomization is uh, an individual or a cluster into an individual randomized control trials, or we simply call them. We do not use the word individual randomized control trials. We simply use uh, randomized control trials for that particular classification of uh, trials. And uh, for those where the unit of randomization is a cluster, we divide them into cluster randomized control trials. So talking about randomized control trials, there are two types of treatment. Let's assume a treatment A and treatment B. 
So we start from there, we take a population, we divide them, uh, we run, so we take a population and we randomly allocate the population into a treatment A and treatment B. And then we are looking for an outcome, depending on the situation. The outcome can be mortality, it can be a disease positive person getting disease negative and so on. And we find out how many of the individuals in the treatment A develop the outcome and who and not develop the outcome and same for the treatment B. So this is an experimental uh, study design. You take a population, you the investigator decides whom to intervene and whom not to intervene. And uh, we find out whether an outcome is established or not. Uh, the defining factor of a randomized control trials is the randomization in itself, which in itself is a detailed topic, but just for the sake of time, I'm not going to do, go into the detail of that. But the main advantage of randomization is that it allocates randomly the known and the unknown factors. So it, to some extent, adjusts for the third variable, which may impact uh, the measure of um, uh, the, the relationship between the, the exposure and the outcome, which in this case, the intervention and the outcome, the intervention being a particular type of medicine and the outcome, which we decide in particular situations. In other that we use the word of confounding, uh, which in itself is needed to be explained. But again, in the sake of, uh, we may touch on that as well in the future sessions, but it establishes causality and it establishes temporality as well. The disadvantages of randomized control trials are that it are costly. Randomized control trials need to have a very specific, crisp, clear uh, research question in the context of the PICO criteria, which we talked about in the previous session, which means that it needs to have a sub, you know, specific population, intervention, comparison group, and outcome. In other words, and it has a very specific population or intervention and comparison group and outcome, then it is required to be generalized to a very narrow population, okay? Therefore, uh, you need, when, uh, when there are issues, by generalizability, I mean that you do a randomized control trial and to whom the results will be applied. So, the result will be applied to a population which is similar to the population from which the sample was taken. And there are a lot of ethical considerations related to the randomized control trials that who, who, who can be randomized and who cannot be randomized. And when you randomize them, what type of educated education you need to give them and what are the requirements of informed consent. And uh, uh, I'm repeating the same things again, uh, a word which is a statement which is getting cliched in this presentation that but the problem is that all of these things need a lot of details same is applies for the ethical considerations it is not possible for me to summarize that uh, all of the details in this short presentation but ethics related to randomized control trials required a, a few uh, at least um, courses separate courses because that has a lot of details uh, so what I would uh, revise is that we talked about different study designs in the bottom of it, when there is no evidence, then there is an editorial and expert opinion. Then we have case report or case series, then uh, cross-section studies, case control studies, cohort studies, randomized control trial, systematic reviews, and in the top, I should have mentioned uh, uh, systematic reviews. Uh, about systematic reviews, I should have mentioned uh, meta-analysis as well. As I've been doing frequently, I will pause once again uh, and uh, I'll see if there are any questions. And uh, apart from some appreciations, there are many silent observers. I think I'm not hearing any questions, which is concerning for me when I do not hear questions. I assume that either I'm doing very well or I'm not doing well at all for the timing. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to talk briefly about different reviews, which are at the top of the uh, hierarchy of the study designs, which is the narrative review and systematic review. Okay, so narrative review is something which is not very organized. You take a topic, 
and you find out the literature, organize the literature and publish a paper on that. But in a systematic review, you have a systematic format of data collection, data research, researching on a particular topic, doing literature search on a particular topic, and then organizing that inclusion and exclusion criteria for different studies and uh, giving due consideration to the methods which are utilized, uh, to the quality of the methods which are uh, uh, of the studies which are included and then summarizing the result in an organized form. So that is a superficial uh, uh, introduction to systematic review and meta-analysis. And with this, I think I am done with my session for the day. Uh, I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to uh, see if there are any uh, questions or not. And uh, I, I think we have a few minutes left and I will request you people who are uh, here that uh, if you people have any question, uh, then uh, you can uh, uh, you can ask me, and uh, I will welcome those questions. I'm going to bring Maham to the screen as well, if he has any comments. So in between, I think uh, uh, there there is one comment. Let me read that comment. So this is uh, from one of our very uh, senior. Uh, colleague uh, Dr. Fawzia Gul, who is the Dean of Medical Education at Khyber Medical University, she has asked this question. And I'm going to show you people on the screen and uh, um, read it for you people. So study on COVID are baseline. That is an uh, expert opinion. Uh, I think uh, on COVID, there have been multiple types of studies which have been done. Uh, a lot of studies which were done on COVID-19 are expert opinions. But there are a lot of, I mean, on COVID-19, the issue is that all of the world have uh, started to do research on COVID-19. So we'll, on COVID-19, very quickly, you will find a lot of different types of study designs. There will be expert reviews, there will be uh, cross-section studies, case control. I'm not sure whether there will be case control studies or not, but I've seen randomized control trials as well. So um, I need to see. Uh, the specific study to which you are referring in this. I have other questions, so I'm glad to see that some questions are popping out. So uh, I'm going to show this comment and then maybe a question. So Hamera Adib asks the question that Expert opinion kind of falls in case report of case series case categories and new observations are grouped together. Uh, I will say expert opinion has their own name in this uh, classification. What is an expert opinion? Is that whenever there is no evidence, a few experts come together and um, develop a consensus. I think I will I will say that case report and case series are very organized, separate entities in the context of study designs but uh, and i will i will say that expert opinion is a category which is separate from case report and case series and uh, uh, and it is in the situation when no or little evidence is present uh, i'll go for other comments so omar ahmed had said would love to have or uh, similar sessions to bring research community to platform. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Matt, for this. Uh, so this is a question from Dr. Abdul Hadi from UK, and he's asking me, I just came from hospital. Is the lecture available on YouTube? Definitely, the lecture will be available on YouTube in the form of a recording, and you can always approach that whenever you want. And it's the, this message is for all of those who will be who will not be able to see it live. We appreciate that you uh, we will be uh, doing a number of sessions on regular basis in the same format and we appreciate if you are able to join us live because we want it to be an interactive session because the exercise of question and answers make uh, the experience more educational but those of you who are not able to uh, uh, join the live session we will appreciate uh, uh, if you can also watch it later on and also give us comments uh, on and feedback because we I read all of the comments and I try to incorporate uh, the comments in the subsequent section sessions, especially in this emerging COVID-19, the virtual education is emerging as a very important uh, uh, 
the platform. So I want to make mature this these sessions. Thanks a lot, Dr. Abdul Hadi, for your comments. And there are a couple of comments. We are just uh, uh, so I think this is perhaps uh, our very senior uh, expert, Professor Dr. Shirin from uh, Khyber Medical University. He has said expert opinion is an anecdotal evidence at the baseline of pyramid of evidence-based medicine. Yes, thanks a lot, uh, Professor Akhtar Shirin Saab. You have given your expert opinion and he, in just a quick introduction to Professor Akhtar Shirin Saab. He's one of the key founding member of the faculty of Khyber Medical University, who is a researcher. And uh, I'm really encouraged by to see some senior faculty members watching this session. Uh, Okay, so Professor Fozegul is asking uh, that what is the next topic? So we will uh, evaluate this session and we will, uh, uh, I, I mean, uh, I think I will be talking about research proposal, but we will discuss with the organizing committee and then uh, on the basis of the feedback which we get after this session, we will, uh, we will come up with the topic and then advertise it subsequently. Okay, and then uh, please share the link of this video in the group. Okay, we'll do that. Thanks a lot. So I think uh, is I've read all the comments and questions. If we still have three minutes for uh, any more questions, uh, if there are no more questions, I will hand over the stage to Maham to conclude the, conclude the session. Okay, Maham. Thank you all for coming to the session. And if you have any more questions, please do leave the comments. Sir will read the comments and reply. And if he does not reply, obviously, he will talk about it in the next session. Thank you so much, sir, for coming to the session and explaining it so well. Okay, and once again, I apologize for starting the session late and some of the audio in the uh, audio problems which you find found in the beginning of the session. And uh, we will see you in the next session, inshallah, and uh, we'll keep you people posted. Uh, thanks a lot to all of you who watched this session live. And I'm also um, thanking all of those in advance who will watch this, the recording of this session. I will request you people to uh, uh, to uh, uh, so and before we we go we have another question and I think uh, I think we are almost done with uh, uh, with the time so those of you who want to continue with us they are welcome otherwise uh, formally uh, yeah we the session is supposed to be for one hour. So in the, uh, this question has been asked, and it is a very important question, that what is reverse causality? And Dr. Manas Fatma has asked this question. I'm going to answer this. Uh, when, so ever there is an association between two factors, for example, as we're talking about uh, smoking and lung cancer, OK? So and you find out the odds ratio. What does that mean? That means that either there are two possibilities. Either smoking led to? Uh, lung cancer or that's one possibility that we know we call as the cause causality or the cause which we intend to establish but there is another possibility that because of the limitations of the study design uh, there is a phenomenon which we call as the reverse causality which means that the the enhanced increase in uh, the the lung cancer patients started to smoke more because they become depressed and they become hopeless and they started to smoke more. So that particular phenomena is known as reverse causality. So whenever you have an association, there are two possibilities. Either the exposure led to the outcome or the outcome led to the exposure. In order to rule out the reverse causality, we are going to do establish temporality. And to establish temporality, we conduct cohort study. And with this, I think uh, there are a couple of more comments. And with that, I'm going to show them very quickly on the screen. And after that, and as I'm showing on the screen and these comments on the screen, I'm going to uh, say uh, thanks and goodbye and assalamu alaikum to everybody for uh, for being the part of this session. And especially, I'm going to thank uh, all of the members of IFMSA, Maham, especially for taking over this time, and the president and executive body and relevant officials from IFMSA for giving me the, this opportunity to use IFMSA's uh, forum to 
to talk to uh, the medical community. Take care for the time being.